So here we go. Uh, this is going to be kind of a dense talk. Uh, there's a lot in it. There's practical aspects, but there's also philosophy. There's even a little bit of mathematics this time. So what I want to talk about is how the insights of anomaly detection, anomaly detection done right, can lead to some very, very interesting capabilities for time series database. And the ideas lead to time series databases that are, first of all, 10 or more times more performant, but also which ultimately can uh, do semantic search on sequences. And that's, that's an extraordinary capability for a time series database. Most of them just draw a graph and not much else. So I'm me. Uh, I work for MapR. Most people can't read hats because they're blinded to advertising. Uh, you can reach me a lot of different ways. Uh, I'm involved with Apache as well and been involved with open source for a very long time. MapR makes a Hadoop distribution which has a lot of cool technology. We can talk about it later. So anyway, let's talk real quick, and I'm going to go very quickly through the first part about what anomaly detection is and how it should be done. So the, the, the problem here is not like many kinds of machine learning where we have examples of what we want to find and then we ask the machine to find more of that. Here we have to find the things we don't know to ask for. It's, it's difficult. The machine has to figure out somehow something that stands outside the normal. And there's a story that the, my, my own journey with uh, uh, anomaly detection started um, when we had a system at Music Match. And the problem was that the CEO would wake up at 2 in the morning and go and check the system and call me and said, Ted, we haven't had a sale in five minutes. Do you think that's okay? I'd go, huh? I mean, what else can you say at 2 in the morning when somebody calls you and asks you a question like that? And so uh, this happened a lot. And, and the real problem was he was often right. And this is very bad for CEOs because it leads them to believe that they're always right. Uh, you should never train a CEO that way. So uh, what we did is we built a system finally, and it was difficult because we had people from Japan, people from Europe, people from the US buying and, and, and so on. And so what we did is we built a system that understood the patterns that we had and would call me first that there was, if there was a real problem, and then it would let him, his dashboard turn red about 10 minutes later. And so he would call me then. He'd go, oh, my God, the dashboard's red, and, and it hasn't had a sale in 12 minutes. I go, Dennis, where you been? I've been on this already. We got it fixed. And we know what's happening. I mean, just go to sleep. You've you got better things to do. And it took about four times, and it trained him to sleep through the night. It's very important to train these people to sleep through the night. It's difficult. Isabel can talk about this sort of difficulty, but with CEOs, you have the same problem. And the idea is once you get a sense of confidence, once they know that you will find problems before they can, it's calm. And actually everything works better because they do what they're supposed to do, which is not minute-to-minute -minute observation. So here's a signal. This is random numbers. You get an idea of what it's supposed to do. And then you see something like this, and you say anomaly. What's happening there is you've built a model in your head. E is normal. Whoa, is not. Now, you might see the spikes like this periodically. That might become part of your normal. And then the step would be the anomaly. So the idea here, again, is the, the normal may not be a simple sort of thing. It may not just be here plus or minus a little bit of noise. Here plus or minus a little bit of noise and occasionally short spikes, but not long steps. You, you, you elaborate very quickly this model in your head. And so you want to make, take action when something breaks, when something abnormal happens. Definition of breaks is not clear. Definition of working is not clear. So we want to trade off action and inaction in the right times. And we want to build a model that does this for us. Here's another look. We could automatically, using things like the T-Digest uh, that I talked about at the bar camp, set thresholds. And then the system can tell us that we can set a budget, we want to be woken up this many times per month, and we want the most of those to be when there really is a problem. And we could build a system like that, where the online summarizer picks whatever percentile we want to set, 
and that sets a threshold. And Mahout has this, and we're done, right? Nine slides, we're good. But not quite so easy. I mean, people have done this sort of thing. Etsy has released Skyline. But what about signals like this? A is easy to find, but B is hard. B is hiding in the valley. And so a simple threshold is definitely not going to work. You also have signals like this, where you get this big anomaly over there. I'd like to think of these signals, though, as not so much anomalies, because that's a heartbeat. Those are important to me. Uh, and here's an anomaly. This is an anomaly in a real heartbeat. There, you've got an irregular heartbeat. The, 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 the shape and the timing changes. So again, we have to have a bit more of an elaborated model. But model is still the key word there. We want a model of what is normal. And then we want to say whatever doesn't fit that model is anomaly. And if we built a good and a tight model that really does express normalcy, then the things that deviate from that will be, honest to God, and important deviations. Now, for simple things, it could just be normal distribution. That's boring. But for the, uh, the EKG signal, the, the electrocardiogram, we can build a model of this signal by taking short windows. And mathematically, the windows are formed by a signal that's a little bump like that. It's really just uh, sine squared or cosine squared. Um, and we multiply it element by element, sample by sample. And so this, it's zero everywhere except in the bump. And so the signal goes away except inside the bump. And so as we move the, the window along, we get different little views of that. And they're all the same length because the window is always the same length. Now, we get, see that signal looks a lot like the one at the beginning. And that one looks a lot like the one at the beginning. And that one looks a lot like the beginning. The idea there is then we could cluster these, these little windowed signals. Now, the, the, the window is chosen very cleverly, not by me, by a guy called Hamming, who came up with lots of clever things, so that when you shift them just by half thing and you add them up, they add up to exactly one. And that means that if you just add up all those little windowed signals, you get the original. Or if you add up some nice approximation of each of the windowed signals, you wind up with a nice approximation of the original. And here, for instance, are the most common shapes for the EKG signal several hours that I looked at. And you can see there's that main, that's the QRS complex. There's another version of it. Slightly shifted, slightly shifted. Another one, another one. And then you have the bumps afterwards and so on. So this thing has learned the shapes that make up a normal EKG. And we can now build the original and we can build the reconstruction. It's probably hard to see, but you can see that the reconstruction is just like the original, except a little bit smoother, little noisy things, the hard things, the, the, the things that don't repeat are fall away. And the reconstruction error here, which is just the subtraction of those, is pretty small most of the time. It's quite rare, in fact, for it to be as large as 100, plus or minus. So this reconstruction thing is a measure of deviation from our, sig our, our normal. And the reconstruction is now a nice signal, kind of like the first one we saw, just a little blivety noise sitting there, no big deviations. So big deviations could be considered anomalies, because we can reduce to that earlier problem. Here's an anomaly, for instance. It's hard to see what that anomaly is, especially if you're sitting over here behind the, the lectern. But here it is magnified. This is, this is indeed a really bad thing. That's the beginning of atrial fibrillation. The, the heartbeat went, did it? It stopped. I mean, that's why the guys survived. Uh, otherwise, probably would be dead, because there's a portable heart monitor that this data is coming from. And the anomaly is that the thing that understands and reconstructs normal heartbeats can't reconstruct this thing that is so anomalous. It's a subtle difference between that and a normal heartbeat, but it's a difference that the model cannot understand, cannot see, cannot reconstruct. And so the reconstruction error has a large error there. Here's another anomaly. This is an instrumentation bug, and the system just says, I can't 
see this as a heartbeat. And so it's just this huge anomaly. So here's a revised system. As a model, we subtract that off, and now we do the online summarizer. And yeah, we got it, well, got it going. And this is model delta sort of anomaly detector. And it's fine. It's good. It does what it says. And the idea here is thinking about probability distributions is a really good way to do this. You can even do this with event streams, where it isn't so much that they follow a same shape, but they happen at irregular intervals. But the irregular intervals themselves have shape to them. They have a model that you can build. Uh, a Poisson thing with variable rate is a commonly used model for that. And so we can build, again, a log a model like that, and we can use log probability as the anomaly for detecting it. So if we just slip back a little bit. We're just a little bit in here, but we have this idea of what anomaly detection is. Build a model, look for anomaly. Look for things that don't match. And we can deal with a lot of different kinds of signals. But here's, here's where philosophy starts. Up to now, it's totally practical things you could build you know, in the kitchen at home sort of thing. But the idea here that's very, very interesting is when we build a model that fits our observations, we are also building a compressor. And it's an interesting mathematical truth that the model that builds the best compressor is also the closest one to truth. Truth being some unobservable what the probabilities really are. Uh, it's a stunning thing, but it's, it's based on the idea that, that the log is a privileged function. It's a special kind of thing. It is the best choice for measuring information, but it also happens to be the thing that determines how much we can compress things. And so taking it to minimal error, making that reconstruction error as small as possible with whatever model structure we have, is maximum likelihood. Maximum likelihood is maximum compression, and by accident, also truth. To get the best understanding out of a signal, we make it as small as possible. The residue of things we don't understand is smaller. Therefore, the bulk of things we do understand is larger. Now, there's nice, wonderful mathematics here, but the shape of things is what's important. This log function here, has a maximum relative to this x minus 1 line exactly at 0 when, when x equals 1. And that's what makes that optimum unique and exact. So if we think about this clustering, we windowed, we clustered, we scaled the cluster to just the right size with the right number of things, uh, that make it as big as so on. We were subtracted from the original thing. And we combine that with this idea of information compression. And so kind of what we're doing there is we're say, taking the original signal, we're encoding it with a probability model, and then reconstructing the signal. And we're trying to make that encoding as tight as possible. And in, in the, the, the simple, tiny, naive Saturday afternoon kind of thing that I built here, it's 10 or 30 to 1, somewhere in that range compression. It's quite, quite tight. But this is also called an information bottleneck. And it's been studied for many years in AI. So we've moved from anomaly detection now to an idea that by reconstructing here, we're building a compact representation, a compact encoding. And in fact, the clustering that we used is the first step in a deep learning system. If we look at a neural network, the way a neural network works is we have, this is a, an auto-encoding neural network. The input is the same as the output, except for the little primes on it, meaning it's not quite exact. The input are values. Those circles are values. Every time we follow an edge, we multiply by the weight of that edge. And when we get to the things in the middle, we add up all the incoming lines. And then we do that again. Those intermediate circles have values. And we go to the output things, and we add up. Now, in the middle layer, there's always some sort of nonlinearity in interesting neural nets. Because if you didn't have the nonlinearity there, you could just kind of reduce it all to one, one step. 
And if you were to look at this, one kind of nonlinearity that we can add is we can say only one of these in interior nodes can be non-zero, exactly one of k. That's clustering. We pick the biggest one. The reason it's clustering is because this incoming step, the sum of weighted inputs, it's a dot product. It's a dot product with the weights. Dot product is the same as Euclidean distance. I mean, x minus y squared, x squared plus y squared minus 2x dot y. And if the magnitudes of x and y are the same, then the dot product there tells us when the distance is smallest. Dot product is biggest where distance is smallest, as we're slipping through all the y's. And so what we're doing when we say only one of these can be non-zero, we're saying pick the nearest cluster. The clusters are those weights on the inputs, and those are the same weights on the outputs because this is a symmetrical autoencoder. So that clustering that we did there, which seemed very simple and easily motivated just from kind of look at it, find patterns sort of mode, is actually a neural net. And it happens to be a special case of a k-sparse encoder. We could say, just pick the three of the things that are the biggest. And we can train them the same way as we would with k-means learning or, or with uh, neural net learning. And then we have one of the more interesting and advanced neural nets that we can apply to this autoencoding signal. And by enforcing that sparsity, we can have many, nor normally you would say you could only have 32 basis vectors, 32 patterns, if you allow dense patterns, the dense reconstructions. That's just vector space sort of things. But if I say only one of k, then I can do like I did here, where I have 400 patterns instead of 32. The window size is 32. That's why I say that. So it's a 32-dimensional vector. I don't have enough fingers to point in all the directions. And, and so by, by having that clustering, having that one of k, I can use a very wide interior layer. And by using m of k, I can cut it down a little bit. And I can encode very interesting signals. So I really have kind of this neural net for the first window, second neural net for the second window, third, and so on. And their reconstructions give us this. This is kind of cool. But we can make these neural nets deeper. On that interior one of k signal, we can do the same operation. We can put a, a further abstracted value, which will give us an iota better compression, and it will give us significantly better understanding. And we don't even need to keep the reconstruction if we don't want to. So what we can do is we can just keep the first level nodes values. But of course, those are encoded by the second level nodes. So we can just keep those with or without an error signal. And so we can just keep that interior node, which is a semantic representation. Now, it's only been in the last five to 10 years that how to learn these models has been practical. This is a new thing to be able to do that. But <clears throat> we have the potential now going from anomaly detection, this modeling idea, to build time series databases that do not store the signal. They store the meaning. They use these ideas of anomaly detection, these ideas of what normal is, the ideas of maximum compression being maximally much like the true model, to compress things and allow now not just signal search, like I want this hour of data and plot it now from that signal, from that signal, but actually to say, I want to find anomalies that look like this one. I want to say, I want to find where the pump failed with this predecessor sort of signal. I want to find more examples of that. I can now say, give me semantic search. And at the same time, the database becomes 10x, 100x, somewhere in there, it depends on the signals, smaller, which is the same thing as the data rate coming in can be 10x larger. This is really kind of cool. And the trick here is you have to be able to build, and there have been a lot of talks about this, you have to use real time and long time together to be able to build these systems. Michael talked yesterday about Lambda architecture, which is an approach to that. I like extending it by using a real time log 
so that you can recover more quickly than just waiting for the batch layer to come back around. And the trick, of course, is that Hadoop and systems like it are not very real-time. The, 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 the ordinary file systems that you use with them are write once, and sooner or later people will see the results, but only after flushing or closing. And so what we want to do is we want to take the stuff that the batch system has processed and the stuff that the real-time has processed, storm, spark SQL, whatever you like, and we need to provide this blended view. And the blended view now consists of taking models built in the long time and applying them in real time to the signal. So I've striven mightily to stop as quickly as possible so we can have time for questions, because that's always the best part of any talk, is hearing what people do and what they're interested in and what they'd like, where they'd like to drive some of this stuff. So there we are. We're at 20 minutes. We've now got 20 minutes to talk. What do you guys think? What do you guys want to do with this? Any thoughts? It's a little bit fast, wasn't it? It's kind of a lot to fit into 20 or 30 minutes. Here's a microphone and a man with a microphone who makes it portable. So I can't claim that I understand all of the mathematics, but it seems to be that intuitively, you know, if we were speaking about, you know, like the model being some form of compression of the underlying data that, uh, and there being some approximation to it, that the more we compress it, uh, you know, the, the, the less clear the signal is going to be and the more approximate it's going to be. And, you know, the, 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 the representation of a data series that has the least amount of error is the data itself. So in order to gain compression, we lose, uh, you know, uh, precision. Is that the right way of thinking about it? No. But otherwise, close. Uh, uh, no, because what I'm talking about is for a particular constant accuracy, what can you do to compress the data the most? And if you hold accuracy constant, you can still compress signals that are not totally random. If they were totally random, then there is no, the, 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 the entropy of the signal is the bit rate. In any real signal, certainly any real signal that we want to interpret the way humans interpret it, and humans are doing a massive job of compression as they see things, as they hear things, what you can do is you can hold the error, you can define what error insignificant means. And I'll get back to that in a moment. And you can hold that constant, and you can still compress. So compression does not mean loss. More compression does not mean, mean more loss. More compression with constant loss means you have a better model. M more compression with a constant model that's totally general purpose, yeah. Eventually, you get down to shit, and you just have one bit, and you go, bit, and, and you've lost all the information. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about holding the loss constant. And also, if you think about it, you know, this was originally 12-bit signals. The error in reconstruction is typically less than one bit on those things. And so all of those less than one bit things can be just encoded as zero with a run length, and you just round when you reconstruct. And then you could store the error when there is a high error. When the error gets large, you can actually store that. Now, anomalies, by definition, don't occur often. Therefore, you store at full bandwidth. You have the semantic representation, and you say, but. And so you just search for but and, and find these sorts of things. And so you have perfect fidelity there. And you have almost always very high compression. Every time things are normal, the system's going, yeah, it's normal type 32, 37, 41. And, and you get it. It's like the, the prisoner's telling jokes. They've compressed it. They have a fine dictionary that, that encodes that. And then when there's an anomaly, you go, but here's the error. So you can still get perfect fidelity or nearly perfect fidelity or fidelity as good as your signal really is. And there's always the question of significance. So yeah, you, you don't have to lose the signal. So, so if the variance in the data is very high, uh, the, the mechanism is not going to perform as well as if it would be a very uniform signal with uh, very rare abnormalities? Well, if, if the abnormalities are not rare, then they are not abnormalities. Uh, so you know, you, you, there's a very slippery sort of semantic arguments there. And 
here, in this original signal, variance is not the issue. Variance is the, the size of that thing. But that isn't the big deal. I mean, it, a little bit. If I have quantization here, see, here's 0 to 5. So if, if 1 is the smallest thing I could do, then clearly having a variance this small means I really have a value of 0 most of the time if I really had a quantized signal. But that would look very different. And I would model it with a dictionary. I would say 0 most of the time, run length, whoa, there's a signal, and so on. And so variance is really not the right concept there. Entropy and relative entropy relative to the model is the correct concept. Now, it may just be words, you do different things than this, so words can be inexact. But a little bit of care is, care is important there. Right next to you, somebody had a finger up. So my question is about what domain sort of to look at the data at, because your talk seems to be focusing on looking at the time domain. So all of your signals are essentially sort of over time. If we actually flip into some other domain, let's say, you know, we do wavelet, you know, sort of decomposition or, you know, uh, Fourier transform, you know, we would basically start looking at a different sort of data sets. Is there any sort of theory behind when one domain is better than the other for the type of thing that you were talking about? Yeah, so, so I think there's kind of like three or four questions in that. Well, and I'm going to start with the simple, most 19th century sort of dis questions. You, you mentioned Fourier transforms. Now, Fourier transforms take a signal of some size uh, or, or some period. And if it's a discrete signal, you can use the discrete Fourier transform and so on. And it restates that in terms of what are called basis vectors. These are sinusoids and co cosinusoids. And it has wonderful properties in that it loses no information and it is optimal in many ways. But it misses the point. You know, back in the 19th century, guys like Fourier and, and, and Hamilton and many others were coming up with this idea from physics, and they had the idea that sinusoids were somehow special and that complete orthogonal orthonormal bases were a very, very important thing. But in fact, that's really not the right way to go. They started with that assumption because they're building and inventing linear algebra at the same time, and they had all these optimality proofs. But that really wasn't the point. <clears throat> and 15 years ago or so, Candace and others came up with this idea that, in fact, signals of interest very, very often are better expressed as a sparse value in a much higher dimensional space. So the idea of overcomplete bases came up. And that's what we have here. We have 400 basis vectors in a 32-dimensional space. It's way overdone. And then we encode as exactly one of them. Now, maybe we could encode as exactly three of them. But a Fourier sort of thing would have encoded it as 32 of 32. And the difference here is that there is apparently a strong correlation to visual perception, very, very much seems like humans do this. And this is how they see things and understand them quickly. Now, there's no reason the world has to work that way. We can imagine worlds that don't work that way. But our world does seem to work that way, at least as we perceive it. And systems that have strong regularities can be shown to have these kinds of properties as well. It isn't just that the human visual cortex or auditory cortex has to be able to see these changes. And so it's importantly true that we don't worry about these orthonormal basis sets. So then we move to wavelets in the 1980s and Dabashis and things like that. Those are an attempt to do the, the Fourier thing with a new set that has what's called compact support, meaning they're bounded in time. But it's still assuming orthonormal complete bases. And the point was sparsity. Sparsity alone has been shown to be a vastly important organizing principle for these learning systems. It alone sparked the entire deep learning revolution, practically. It alone has been the driving principle that allows now computers to do almost anything we can do at a glance. 
the, the Android speech recognition system is based on these. And so <clears throat> I really try to draw a line from the, the 19th century view of these physics-based, minimal bases. It's a very different kind of thing. So that's one of two of three questions. Then you asked, where does this work? Whew. I'd spaced it out entirely. Uh, I don't know. There's, there's lots of systems it does work in. It works in text. It works, based on my prior work, on genomes. It works in time series databases. It works in video databases. It works in auditory databases. But it has to be things that have regularities that can be discovered by these methods. These methods are not very well understood yet, and so we don't know what the bounds and limits are. My guess is anything that compresses super well with a nice, understandable compression scheme, it's basically the same as what I showed. And of course, the stuff I showed here is incredibly naive and simple. It's what fits in 20 minutes, my god. Uh, yeah, there's somebody over here. Any applications um, you could recommend to have a closer look and where it's implemented your model? Like you said, to not uh, get the CEO, the CIO, waked up during the night. Yeah, I don't yeah. know, like uh, how Skyline works from Etsy. Uh, is it actually applying uh, what Scout. you told? Sorry, you I missed in... the connection between CEOs and Scala. But no, Skyline. Uh, what you showed. Scaling. Them. The, from Etsy, Skyline. Skyline. I don't Got know it. how it works, it. but this yeah, is yeah. So uh, Skyline is is a very simple tool. You set, or I think you can automatically set, possibly thresholds, and things cross them. So it doesn't do any kind of learning along these lines. So that's so do we you have any example what? of applications where it's yeah, yeah. There's, there's many applications for this, and it's always places where systems are not possible to be watched continuously. No, I mean so, implementations, examples where it's actually... Power plants, medical instrumentation, uh, oil fields where they're drilling and... I meant software-wise. Like what? Software-wise? Software-wise. Software -wise, no, I don't have place. example. I mean, this all is on GitHub, but it's a little bit small to be used in any honest-to-God applications. I don't know of any open-source software that does this in a general way. Now, this is very, very close to things like the OpenTSDB, which is an HBase based uh, system that uses the, to advantage the fact that HBase arranges things with sequential keys together, and so that you can read stuff. And it also uses this idea that you would compress historical data into little blobs. Now, it has the problem that it stores the exact data in the database, and so it's limited speed-wise, dramatically. I mean, without that one limitation and with a real-time data store of other forms, you can get, and, and we've had systems that exceed 100 million data points per second. But anywhere, any industrial thing where things break and cost people money, they want to find these. And so those are the applications. I, but I don't have openly available software. We have several customers doing this, but they don't make their software open source. Yeah, we're going to have to do traveling salesman. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I have a question concerning one of the, the figures in the beginning when you showed the neural network. Um, so the input and the output layer. Yeah, keep talking. Um, the individual neur neurons in the input and the output layer, they are um, the signals at a particular instance in time. Is this right? It signals at a particular instance in time yes. after windowing. So are the different input nodes different instances in time? or? Yeah, and so yes. then we have uh, a separate neural net for each half window step. So here's the first uh -huh. window, there's the first half window step, here's the next window over. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. So, so I got it right. And um, then the the um, reduced representations, the compressions that you get in the in the middle layer. You talked about the sparseness you're using there for, for the clustering. So um, uh, I'm. What is the 
intuition or what is the reason for using a sparse representation in the hidden layer? Why don't you use a smaller hidden layer, a smaller number of nodes, smaller dimension, and the full space? Like, why don't you generate distributed, kind of distributed representations? Yeah, so that, that's a very interesting question. Yeah. And that's taken, well, I, I can't say that it's been answered. But since the early 80s and since even before with the early uh, distributed representation work in, in the mathematical sphere, uh, people thought that the best way to do a bottleneck architecture like this, where you have the small center thing, that the best way to do that was to have a small number of nodes that all could be activated, and you would put some regularization on that by like try to minimize the sum of the squares of the weights. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very, very common idea. And, and there, there are results that, that show that um, the representations you get are something like the, um, how is it called, uh, what, what they do in Latin semantic indexing. The, um, They're very much like an SVD. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 and they don't work. Uh, sometimes. Sometimes they do, but not very well. Um, you, you know about current work of, of Google, like uh, producing such reduced representations for words in, in language, or the old work? Yeah, in but the, the 90s. best ones are all sparse. And the sparseness, yeah. Yeah, I think you're talking about Mikhailov's work. Yeah. So this guy has some very interesting ideas that, that he encodes words and the directions encode relationships between words. Yeah. So you can have words here. And the plurals will all be the same direction and distance from the originals. You can have man and woman, and you get king and queen, same direction, same magnitude from these others. And he does use dense representations, yeah. but very few people have been able to replicate that work. And all of the operational systems that, that are doing seriously good work, the image recognition systems, the speech recognition systems, use interior sparse representations. And so it isn't clear, really it isn't, what's going on there in a deep sense. But it does seem that sparsity is a very, very important property. And that's been true, it's been very clear since the late 90s with the compressive sensing literature that sparse representations were very, very powerful in encoding physical phenomena. You know, if you, if you want, so in a dense representation, if we're looking at a time series, we have some signal that's band limited. We have to have samples often enough that we have no aliasing of signals. That's the Nyquist sort of thing. We have to sample often to characterize a real signal. That was the theorem from 1800s till recently. And if you know, though, that the signal is, say, a mixture of three sinusoids, it has to be no more than three sinusoids mixture, not a continuous mixture. Then you need very few data points. You need about five to be able to characterize it, regardless of how long a period that is. You can find out which sinusoids it is. Well, not regardless, but yeah, a little bit of hand-waving there. And so you can use far, far less information. You have a massively underdetermined system and with this sparsity constraint, you can represent that. Now, there's also some talk about how rotationally symmetric representations, the dense representations that you talk about, have lower learning complexity, and large dimensions have higher dimensionals, and non-rotational ones higher complexity. But the fact is that these high-dimensional, non-rotationally symmetric systems that are sparse have very, very low learning complexity. And, and the representations are very easy to learn. And they're easy to interpret. They're easy to search for. I mean, like an elastic search can take these sparse things and drop them into an index. And so there's some very important properties. As I say, not well understood. But it does appear to be very, very important. And it does appear to be biologically very plausible, built into us. And we are better at this than any computer so far. So it's not a, a bad thing to take a hint. Thank you. Not that airplanes are birds, but the hints are still good. I was wondering, um, in one of the graphs you showed uh, a, a zigzag line with a spike and then a systemic shift. Um, that may occur if, for example, you're measuring performance of a website and there's a new release and it turns out to be a lot slower. 
um, or faster. Uh, how, how would you uh, update the model? Would that be a continuous process or would that be some other way? What do you think that should be done? You know, somebody talks about the, the, the hard, the, there's very few hard problems in computer science. It's like naming schemes and cache coherence and so on. Well, there's very few universal answers, but the, the universal answer is it depends. And you just earned that, that answer. But okay, the, thank you. Uh, the, it, 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 it starts with the thing that when you detect an anomaly, it may be good or bad. You may have just released a new, much better system, like you say. And that would be an anomaly. This is not working the way it used to. System panics and it goes, ah, ah. And you go, it's all right, it's all right. I knew, I, that's, I knew about that. That's good. And you, know, you want the alarms to go off when you do something like that. It's a little bit of confidence-inspiring sort of thing. How do you train after that? Well, if the world has changed, like the shift, then training in an online fashion that keeps a big memory of the past is disastrously bad. Starting over at zero and having a very low resolution model for a short time that gets better and better as you go along. Now, the past could give you prejudices about what kinds of models you might see, some priors. But the details of the previous model are the things that need to be rejected quite quite decisively at that moment. And the, the classes of models, the priors, can still inform you so you can learn very quickly. But yeah, if, if things change, you have to change the models. Otherwise, the alarm will just go off forever. And that's not useful. There was somebody in the back, yeah. There were several people in the back, actually. Yeah, we'll have to make a backside tour of the microphone. You ever notice that when people smash into the room, they always stand in the back? So obviously shy people come late. Yeah. Um, so all the techniques that you, that you showed um, assume that some windowing happens before. So all of the time series things the time I did. time series techniques, yeah. So does that mean that um, they apply to, um, to scenarios where the length of a period is constant and is, and is known up front? Or does it also work with the variable uh, or with varying, varying period length? Or is there a simple trick to make it work with a varying period length? Um, there's a simple trick in the data that I had, which was pick a window length that's small enough that the clustering will finish before Sunday comes. Uh, so that was, that was my strategy there. And then, oh my god, Sunday morning, it works. That was really good. Now, uh, the real world is not usually so forgiving and, and requires a little bit more thought than that, than this is just what I can get to work. And there's, there's two considerations. One is how large do you make? I'm trying to find you the prize that I award for a good question. Uh, yeah, because that really is a deep question. What size do you make that window? And in the signal that I showed, you make it as short as plausible to still capture the short time scale features. And then you ask, do you use a variable time window? And the answer is, if you really have the deep learning stuff, so the, the window I had was too short, for instance, to detect a change in the heart rate, which is pretty important, you know, as, as heart signals go. But the, if we start building the, the deep learning system, where it, it has higher and higher levels, I'm totally distracted here. But if you start building the, uh, the higher levels, then you, there it is. Can you catch? There you go. Whoa, no, can I throw is the question. Uh, that was off by an entire meter out of 10. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, the, 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 the question is, the, the, the deeper layers will start encoding regions of windows. And so they start gathering data from a longer time stream. And so the low-level window can be usually fixed and relatively short. And then the deeper layers start encoding the larger signals. Basically, symbol co-occurrence. Heartbeat there, nothing. Heartbeat with a shift over here. That means heart rate ux and so. That's the idea. Now, details will vary. When this really hits a real problem, 
it won't be looking quite like this. So that was a good question. And then uh, the so lady over there. Sorry, we're running out of time. We're out of time. Catch me in the hall. Such a sadness. Oh, good. She says one of the questions was answered by pure luck and, and clever to see you did deserve the little. Now that is open source candy, so you have to share. <laughs>